Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see you again. It's our third meeting um, with synergy between beware and self-sustainable, self-sufficient homesteading and gardening. And we're very excited about today's topic. We're talking about the start of the bee season and uh, the spring season. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but my fingers have been itchy a long time to start planting. And um, even though it's still a little bit chilly on my side, I've started to put in some seeds um and protecting them a bit because i just cannot wait anymore so <laughs> yeah so um i think uh warwick if you start with your preparations for beekeeping for for the season starting that would be great all right great thanks Anna. yeah i mean it's just been everybody thinks like first of september is the big day but actually i mean that's a great day don't get me wrong you know it's spring right yeah. but uh Actually, bee season officially starts 1st of August in South Africa, in, southern, in the Southern Hemisphere, <clears throat> simply because uh, what you need to do is all the prep beforehand, and also the bees start trekking because, and splitting, because, it, because they know what's coming as well, instinctually, this time of year. And, and what they, where they've been so far has been in a period of dearth, just like pretty much everything in nature at the moment, Southern Hemisphere, over the winter period. So having said that what's going to happen is that usually if they haven't had enough food up until now they're going to either they're either going to split or they're going to actually swarm the entire colony will swarm and go to a place where there is food and uh so this is vital for beekeepers this time of year especially beginner beekeepers they're always asking us you know where do we get bees from how do we get bees you know if we especially if we can't afford to buy bees because that's fairly an expensive uh avenue of going where you can actually just get bees and catch them if you know how to do that so we'll cover a little bit about that today as well but uh, if you're already a beekeeper who's already beekeeping anybody in the group if you're going to wave your hand or uh you know say hello okay cool anthony awesome robert how's it welcome uh patrick cool well done all right i can't see everybody but i'm assuming there's a few more of you but if you're already beekeeping and there are a few of you guys on board uh you know one of the one of the most important things right now is actually clearing your your apiary area all right if you if you you should have had a fire breaker in the beginning of winter anyway, at the end of autumn, but right now you need to go in and clear your apiary, make sure that you have easy access to your bees and uh, any debris and everything that, that's uh, fallen over or, or overgrown or whatever during the winter period, unlikely, but it can happen. Make sure it's all cleared up, ready for the bees to have efficient access to, the, to their hives. That's one of the things that's really important. Um, in, in addition to that, look, I'm going to hand over to Tanya now as well, because I know you guys have to do as homesteaders, you've got to prepare as well. So uh, give us some insights in, into what your guys' preparation is around ground, groundworks and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's a pity, Getting Warwick. We, yes, it's such a pity we only started with um, the Zoom talks now, because preparation for spring actually starts right in the beginning of winter already. Uh, trying to or, or getting some mulch on the soil etc and letting the soil rest in some places um, and working in some compost etc but seeing that we've only started now we must do with what we have at this time that we have so it. and it's not too late it's not too late um, it's just there's longer routes we take from winter which we all do ourselves because homesteaders like to to, to do things themselves with, with, the, with the resources they have in general. Um, but we can still, it's August, we can still make some plans with what we have. Otherwise, we just bring in a heap of compost if we haven't been working on our compost heaps. And we start off like that. Now, um, something that's very important to me and that I've learned a lot about is... Um, planning versus no planning and i'm an impulsive type of person i don't plan a lot but no. i've realized Real? <laughs> yes <laughs> yes now i've i've realized over the years um that the no planning system is not working so well for me <laughs> why because you'll see on the group oh how what did i plant uh, can somebody identify this for me? Um, I'm not sure what this is. And, and then you just don't know. And I've planted some really awesome varieties and that I've never seen in my life before. And then it's right. been plucked out because you're thinking it's a weed or something else. So you lose yeah. a lot of your wonderful stuff that you, that you don't know what it is. For instance, I planted tenza for the first time last year. I didn't mark it. I don't know where my tenza is. I don't think it ever survived. And Tenzo was like this crop that I'm really, really excited about. Um, so no plan versus plan. And I see the no plan people, like the, the, the very um, 
the guys in permaculture, they do a lot of planning, yes, but they also like their food forests and everything just goes anywhere. Um, you have this growing next, you know, it's just, it's not rows and etc. So I do like a food forest too, but I do want to know what I plant. So um, in terms of planning, I've learned that now we need to plan. So my first thing that I do obviously is, is make sure the soil is prepared so it can either rest or just then um, start de uh, the, the moss decomposing, etc. on the soil, right. etc. So that, yeah. while that's busy, I take out my seed supply. Now I've got uh, probably about 250 different varieties of seeds. And then I sit and I start planning, what do I want to plant this season coming? So I work through all of them. And once I have determined what I want to plant, um, I start doing my markers. I start preparing markers. I don't know if you can see, let me see. There we go. I've got these little plastic markers I write on. So I prepare them beforehand. So they're all ready. So by the time I want to plant, it's not like, oh, I still have to do the markers. They're already ready. So Brilliant. that's all ready. And I pack it in a little tray with the seeds and the markers, seeds and markers. So you don't have to, I've, I've gone through that as well, tucked all the markers in the one tray and the, all the seeds in another tray. And with, with so many varieties that I do plant, it gets quite frustrating. <laughs> so having it a bit organized is very, very good. Yeah. And then what I also like do that. is I draw a picture of my, of my gardens. I've got more than, I've got four vegetable gardens. And then I draw a picture. I'm not very technologically inclined, so I like it with pen and paper. I draw a picture and then I decide what do I want to plant there. And what's important about this is crop rotation because um, you can't plant beetroot and onions and potatoes and everything in the same bed the whole time. You have to rotate it, you know, because um, things like your beans are nitrogen fixers. So you plant beans and then in that one, you, next time you plant some carrots or whatever the case may be. So crop rotation is very important. And if you do keep track, um, with a chart that you draw of your garden, then you know, oh, last time, well, you will probably know if you're involved, but you'll know in the last three years or whatever, what you planted where, and your crop rotation goes really well. Um, so um, that's another part of the planning that's very important. Then also I started with my seedling um, trays, etc. I do have some seedling trays, but I've got a really exciting thing we're working on. I don't know if any of you would be interested in, in hearing more about. Um, oh, are you talking about what we're working on or is it something else? Well, well, it's another thing. Oh, no, <laughs> another thing. All right, the, cool. The, the poo thing, what to do with poo. Do you remember? Oh, yes, I remember that. What to do with poo. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we'll do that talk. You, need, you can't miss it. So Not if you guys all. are interested with what to do with poo and it's something got something to do with with the containers that you plant your seedlings your seeds in um just give us a thumbs up or something then we can know if you would like to do because he can do stuff with poo and i can do stuff with poo so yeah. i'm making these awesome containers and we will share it with you if you're interested um and just, my just fingers Hmm? Just to interject yes. there quickly, Tanya, on this note, just so that the guy, I mean, we might have people here that don't know about the project, the side project that we're working on besides doing the Zoom talks on, on Friday, yeah. is, uh, is that we, we, we're building a, a side project, guys, that's around packaging the best kind of seeds for bees, for mm -hmm. homesteaders and smallholders and anybody who's got a small plot or anything like that that wants to grow, grow something that's edible. Uh, whether it's it's short term, medium term, long term, we're going to have the three most likely three different packages, and that's something we're going to. It's a work in progress right now. So those are what we. That's where we are with that. And then you're going to be able to buy them according to what you want to do. You know, if you want to just grow something that's short term, and it's a cash crop, for example, we'll have a pack of uh, seeds that are a going to be most beneficial for the bees, but also are going to benefit from having bees. So it's going to be a, an awesome synergy and symbiosis between the beekeeping side of things and the homesteading side of things and self-sustaining gardening, where we can promote pollination, the boosting of, 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 um, of the yield and the crop yield and the harvesting on those particular um, seeds that are planted by you guys. And then obviously the, the honey that you're going to get from the bees is just going to be a bonus, right? And so is all the other byproducts that we're going to be talking about through, throughout this, this, uh, the Zoom talk series. Yeah, cool. Uh, just thought I'd, Great. I'd put, remind everybody about that and introduce it to anybody who didn't know about it before. So cool. Yes. That's going to be our yeah. bees, seeds for bees kind of project. Name not 
name, you know, to be decided. <laughs> yes. But that is yes. trademark. And you can send us a copyright us. okay, just in case we decide to use it. <laughs> and you can send us suggestions if you like. And yes, please. Um, yeah, we get a lot of questions from people. What can we plant for the bees to to get more pollinators into our gardens, yeah. etc.? So this will be a very helpful resource. But anyway, so yes, back to the seedlings. Um, I couldn't wait. I know it's still a tiny bit cold, but I just said stuff that I can't wait anymore. So I went outside. I've probably planted about 50 different varieties of things um, into my little containers, which we will tell you about, tell you about in what to do with poo. And um, uh, yes, I've covered them with straw. So the cold won't affect them so much. So uh, let's good. see how they germinate. You maybe by next week, I can give you some feedback and some photos on, on how yeah. it's going. So yeah, yes. Perfect. So that's another thing, depending on which area in South Africa, or I see uh, Robert is from Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. what the weather is that's like where you are. As well. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and in Cape Town, I see Paul is joining for the first time. Hi, Paul. Anyway, so depending on what your weather is like, where you are, you can start planting. It's warm enough in some areas. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking a bit of a risk because we get a lot of frost here. And our weather starts getting really warm up here in Limpopo. And then we get that we get that surprise frost, which kills everything off. So that's why I've got the grass, uh, the hay on Just top in of case. my... Of, yes. Yeah. So, but my seedling trays are ready, the ones that are still empty. And uh, they, uh, they are only not filled yet because I haven't had time for everything. So that's something you can look at. Um, make sure you've got your germination mix in, in place. Um, and what are you using for your germination mix? So you need to prepare that. You need to think about these things. Um, do you need to go buy vermiculite uh, for your vermiculite for your for your seedling trays? What do you want to put in there? I use for mine is very very basic and simple. I use my vermicompost from my worm farm, and that's another thing we can discuss in future as well. How to 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 build a worm farm because it's yeah. such a nice thing to do. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so it can create income it. as well, right? Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. There's a, there was a bee, there was a project. Sorry, just quickly to interject, but no there's problem. been a there's a bee, there was a bee, there was a community project. Let's put it this way, wasn't just bee, but there was a community project that I saw in East London. I consulted on about three years ago, and um, these guys were building. They were doing welding. They had a welding school, and then they were doing welding, and then they were doing furniture making, and then they would do, then they wanted to. They were actually they already started beekeeping. That's why they got us got me involved on the consulting side but um they uh they were doing all sorts of stuff it was pretty cool and um at the end of the day they were had they also had a word farm they actually had a word farm and i mean they had when they showed us this they were making uh i can't quite remember the figures now because it was it was off topic for me but they showed us they obviously took us on a tour around and they had they had towers of about four buckets deep sure. and then with a tap at the bottom you know and uh, in the last one, and I mean, these guys were generating, obviously they must have been generating X amounts, you know, of, of super juice, super food for the plants on a weekly basis from this, from this farm. And I mean, out of the four towers, uh, made up of four towers each, not all of them were four at this stage, because obviously they were staging and tearing them, but uh, most of them had four towers and um, uh, they had, must have had, it was about five, five rows, five columns by about six deep. So what's that, 30, mm -hmm. give or take, plus four towers. It was a really good little setup, you know, and a, a nice little income owner on the side. And if so, so if you're not using it yourself or if you're using some of it yourself, cool, mm -hmm. but you could also look at selling it on to people who want organic fertilizer. Awesome. Brilliant. So thanks for yeah, that one. Mine, That's great, great idea. I've got two worm farms at this stage. I've used old baths to build them and the baths works beautifully. Um, and uh, I just keep adding, I just had one and then I had to do a demonstration. So I added another one. So I think I should organize another demonstration so I can add yeah. some more, which is just so much fun. And I've got a lady um, that comes and she loves just picking out the worms and then giving me the soil. I, well, there's a method to, to, to have the, to let the worms move away so you can have a soil, but she just loves uh, with her, to 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 take it out with their hands, and interestingly enough, um, there's been some articles uh, that I've seen that, that that says that 
by putting your hands into soil, there's microorganisms in the soil that actually helps against depression um, and it raises your mood, et cetera. So, so it's just, uh, it's, um, it's a really great thing to do. And when you, if you take that wormy compost and you just put it to your nose, it just smells so lovely and earthy. It's just so rewarding. You need to do this anyway, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll do a talk on that too. So back to our germination mix, I use my wormy compost. Then I use some sweated poo, see what to do with poo. Um, uh -huh. I've got lots of that. I've got cattle, I've got goats, I've got sheep, I've got chickens. So I've got a lot at my disposal. So, and it lies on heaps. Um, and by the way, the chickens love it. If you've got heaps of poo lying, they scratch in it and they find all the grub worms, et cetera. So then I mix it with, with my sweated poo, my vermi compost, and I add some sand. And if I'm gonna use small trays, then I add some vermiculite. So those are things to look at. You get germination mix at the nursery, et cetera, but I'm quite a frugal person. So I want to use what is at my disposal. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been working for me for years. So that's something you need to look at, getting your seedling trays and your seedling mix ready. On, um, on a, just on a quick note around compost, right, um, and fertilizer. Um, yes. Interestingly enough, one of the one of the bylaws in in South Africa, at least that I know of, um, generally speaking, is that the cities and the municipalities, for obvious reasons, in some cases, uh, prefer that they stipulate that bee, bee beehives shouldn't be kept within five meters of a compost heap. Okay, so that's just something to, to keep note of for anybody who's wanting to keep bees yeah. or is keeping bees right now. Um, I think it's largely just sim simply so that bees don't take any of the infected any infected water or substances from the compost itself but the thing is, is you know what you can't you can't control bees and in any event bees are whenever they return to the hive everything has been co coated with propolis and they do get checked by by the guard bees anyway at the front door um, so generally speaking the only issue really would would is to is to make sure that you keep into the bylaws you know I don't see there being a great risk with that but I just think it's a good point to make now while we're talking about fertilizer. Okay, that's a good point. Thanks. Tanya. Listen, I see there's a question. Um, what are the towers for? Uh, basically, uh, they, when I've, you have I've typed an answer. Worms, this, uh, okay, you can answer that. But no, no, no. Carry on. Go, go for it. <laughs> okay, the towers they put them on top of each other. So when the when you water them, because you need to give them some water, it runs through all these little all these containers, and at the end of the bottom, you've got a tap. And um, then you can harvest your worm tea, et cetera. So yeah. the liquid that comes from it. Yeah. So I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, uh, Warwick? No, I said I was, yeah, pretty much the same thing. And then okay. obviously the degradation of the stuff goes through the different towers as well. Right? Yes, absolutely. But, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, okay. So, um, I mean, in terms of the beekeeping side of things, we, we, also do, we also have to do maintenance this time of year. So aside from the apiary, uh, what's imp what's really important is you actually, if you're already keeping bees, and they, I know we are, we have a few people on board here, that you should be doing your annual inspection right now. Um, I do. There is a caveat. There is there are conditions in terms of this, which is basically like Tanya was saying, if your area is expecting any kind of cold front or frost right now in the next week, obviously don't open your hives because you're going to break the seal of propolis on those hives, and uh, that's what keeping that's what's keeping the internal climate control of the of the hives more, most efficient. All right, so if you go and break the seal now, you're going to be introducing gaps in there and we don't want that if the cold front's coming. However, if you suspect and if you can find out uh, using the weather service apps and stuff like that over the next week, two weeks or so, you're not, you're not expecting any cold fronts, by all means, you should be doing your maintenance inspection like ASAP. And the reason for this is that over the last, you know, over this period of the time of this year, what's happened is, is that uh, with the bees and the queen laying like up to queen anyway laying up to 2,000 eggs a day during the height of the summer peak period okay what's happened is that that's all contracted now down to 300 eggs a day during the dearth period because there's not enough food for them to keep going and, there's, and they do not need to use the same amount of resources so and at times what can happen is that they actually expel and boot out the drones the male bees okay because all they do really is they are the lazy boys you know they're, they're like the lazy teenage boys that just want to eat party and sleep okay so they only take up resources and they're really their only value, they don't do any work in a hive. Uh, the only value is to actually mate the queen when there is one to mate with, which is not, not yet. 
that will be probably in the next three to four weeks, give or take. So if you have been seeing drones, the big, the big, big Jeep, uh, Cherokee Jeep style um, bees being kicked out of your hive and they're dead on the floor, you know now, you now know why. But what, what are we going to do during the maintenance period? Well, I do cover a lot of this in my in online course that we offer now and our workshops that we have in Midrand. But um, essentially what you're trying to do is that with all of that laying that's been happening in the hive, a lot of the time the, the, what happens is whenever a new bee comes out of the cell, um, that cell gets cleaned and then it gets, re, it gets um, a, a, a very tiny, a micro, a micro amount of, of a relaying, basically a resurfacing of that cell. And eventually what ends up happening is that your original cell size at 100% becomes 95, becomes 90, becomes 85, becomes 80. And what can happen if, if that period of time if over a period of two years, let's say, you nobody's done any maintenance, annual maintenance on your hives, okay, on your brood especially, what ends up happening is not only does your is the opportunity for your queen to lay uh, low, lay eggs lower because now you're reducing the amount of space that she has available, but also the size of her bees will get smaller because the cell size is smaller. So when the space is smaller, so do the bees become smaller when they emerge, okay. So what we're trying to do here is you need to open up your hives, brood box. Brood, brood, the deep, the deep um, uh, brood, okay, uh, for the people that, because uh, there's different terminology wherever, wherever you are. So the way the deep frames are versus the shallow, shallow frames are, we want to, we want to go for the deep frames or brood frames, okay, where the queen is. You open up your colonies, open up the hive, and you start taking out the frames there that are, A, have got only honey in them, and B, are very dark. If they're really, really dark brown and or black, those need the entire frame needs to be not the frame itself but the comb itself needs to be removed okay um, and how to do this well you just use a hard tool you can use a knife um, and collect that stuff don't throw it away collect it in a bucket and leave a little strip at the top of the frame just underneath the frame only needs to be about a centimeter long um, or up until the first wire if you're using fra a wire frame wire in your frames okay leave that little strip there because what will happen is that then you don't need to replace uh, any wax sheets or wax strips into the frame itself because the bees will just continue building from where you've left this little strip at the top there, okay, of the comb. And if it is, if it's old and it's and it's nasty or it's full of honey or whatever the case, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about that because that little strip they're going to they only use it really for honey and pollen, okay. So they don't normally lay eggs in that area. So the main thing is is to take out all that all that old uh, comb and process it. Because especially the dark comb is going to be hard, but it's going to be full of propolis. And the beauty about this, guys, is once you've processed it, if you've squeezed it, you've put it through a, a, a what do you call a, a pet, not a petticoat, what do you call those things? Stockings. What do they call them? The old stockings. If you put it through an old stocking and squeeze the hell out of it, you're going to get all the honey coming out, but none of the impurities, okay? If you don't have an extractor. Um, but in this case, anyway, you don't want to use an extractor. You need to actually get the comb off the frame. And then the bees are going to build new comb, and that gives the queen new space to lay. So that's your annual inspection. That's what you have to do now, okay, of the next week. Bear, bearing in mind that you don't have any cold fronts coming, that's what you're doing in the next week. Following that, you need to do feeding, okay? And the feeding right now, during the winter period, was a two to one ratio, okay? The reason being that's, that's so that's a kilogram of, of uh, yeah, a kilogram of, of sugar and two liters of water, for example, or in whatever ratio of that that you'd like, or a liter of water, 500 grams of sugar, okay? That was, um, that was during the dearth period, okay? What we need to do now is we need to switch it up. We switch it up to the other version of feeding, and that is a one-to-one -one version, and this stimulates brood growth, okay? Whereas two-to-one stimulates, or well, it doesn't stimulate, it actually just maintains feeding. It maintains the glucose level, okay? Whereas the one-to-one -one is, a, is, a, is a brood stimulant. And what do I mean by that? Well, basically the queen will start laying like that. And that you want that, why do we want that? The reason why we want that is because if she starts laying now, if you've give, A, you've given her the space to lay, you've cleaned out the, the frames, the old frames. Remember, it's only frames with full of honey and no, no larvae or eggs on them, and, and frames with really dark coat, okay? <clears throat> Those are the ones you take out of the brood. If there's any eggs or if there's majority of eggs, anything bigger than this on a frame, in the, leave it, okay? Um, 
So you're taking those out, you're giving her space to lay, and then you're going to feed the feeds at the same time. And the reason why you're doing that is because that, gen that gives her the ability to lay more than 300 eggs a day. And what ends up happening is you go to 500, you go to 800, you go to 1,500 eggs a day that she's going to be laying on the next week. Continue this process for the next two to three weeks, okay? Uh, and we'll come back after Tony had, a, had a, a, a bit more of a chat about what crops you should be looking at now as well. Um, but I'll refer to that a little bit later in the thing. But the reason why we feed them is so that we can boost the laying process. And, and why we're doing that now is because the bees take like 18 days to get made from the day they get laid, okay? So if they lay now 300 eggs a day, those 300 bees emerge 18 days from now. When's that? Well, that's knocking on spring's door, okay? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage the bees to be ready, just like Tanya has been talking about getting the seed beds ready and all that actually should have been done a while back. With bees, it's 1st of August, okay? 1st of August is when we start because then you get 18 days and from the 18th day, you're going to have to start overlapping of however many bees she was laying now, start emerging. And by the time they do their, do, do, you know, then bees aren't foraging until they're about 30 days old, okay? Because they've got house, they've got house chores to do. So when they come out, they become cleaners, they are wax builders, there are um, nannies and all that stuff first before they ever leave the hive, okay, to go foraging. So you've got to remember all of this in your processing and your planning, like Tanya was referring to earlier on. You have to have this as part of your, as a beekeeper and as a homesteader, it's vital to have a calendar, a planning calendar for the year. And this is one of the vital parts of the year to, to do this and to focus. Why are we doing this? As soon as stuff starts flowering in September, you don't want the bees to spend their time growing and laying so much. They will be doing that anyway, but you want to have a workforce. You want to have the hive at its at, at a top uh, production rate already by the time the flowering comes so that they take advantage, full advantage of the, of the ability to create and harvest excess honey for you, for themselves and for them and for you, okay? That's why we're focusing on doing this right now. This is, this is the plan. Um, instead of use, utilizing the time when the best flowers are out in spring to build a colony, we're taking the opportunity to build a colony now so that they can take advantage of the, of the springtime later. And pretty much the same as if, same as what Tanya was talking about with regards to the, um, to the prepping for, for, for the homesteading and growing. Okay. So cool. Over to you, Tanya. What's yes, your guys' next step? It's quite amazing. Uh, while you were talking, I was thinking the principles are so aligned because we need to do things in the garden as well. Yes. And, and if we do the right things, then we will get a huge crop. Uh, just as if when you're doing the right things with beekeeping, you will get lots of, new bees and lots of honey and i just want to say hi to emil's little daughter there hi <laughs> anyway all right there were some questions um i patient says i'm in newfontaine pretoria i really need to know what to plant well for spring there's so many things you, you can't, can plant um our crucifers our cabbage families are past now we shouldn't concentrate on that anymore so we're moving on to the tomatoes and the beans and the pumpkins uh things like that and um so it might, as I said, might be a little bit early still for things that are frost sensitive. If you've got frost in your area, patients, just look out for that and, and maybe protect them. But I don't know if you've seen, I mean, before the season even starts, you see people next to the, all these little um, vendors next to the street have got lovely tomatoes and lovely beans. And you're thinking, but I've only planted mine. What's happening? And uh, that's this whole thing of start early. If you start early, um, and you protect them, then you've got these crops much quicker. And a good thing about starting early is um, you kind of, um, you, you skip some of the pests because the pests only come later um, when it's a bit warmer. So the ideal is if you have like a little greenhouse or stuff to start your seedlings in, etc. if you're in a very cold area still. <clears throat> but I would um, look at, to answer your question, looking at planting, um, my beans and my tomatoes, what else? Um, there's so many things that you can plant for summer. I'm, I've planted carrots today and I'm gonna plant beetroot and spinach, etc. cetera. Warwick, um, what would you recommend planting now for the bees? Like basil, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a cool question as well and uh, really important. So fast stuff that can grow now, sunflowers, uh, if you plant that, sunflowers, sweet mm. basil. Um, yes. 
I think we've spoken about rosemary and lavender before, but they're not that fast, obviously. Um, <clears throat> but things like, um, you know, even things like watermelon, uh, pumpkin, any one of these will, A, A, they benefit from the bees pollinating them. They get bigger yields, you get more yields as well, more uh, production out of the stuff, more, more stuff to harvest. Um, and they flower fairly quick, you know, they flower fairly quickly. Um, what's going to be flowering, so what's cropped now, what the crops are now basically is you need to be focusing on things like the aloes if you're in the Haarfeld area. There'll be proteas in the, in the Western Cape, for example. Um, Lucerne, Lucerne's on now, if it's allowed to go to flower, but it, the, the honey production depends on the pH, pH balance of the soil with Lucerne, funny enough, the more balanced it is, um, I think it needs to be more alkaline actually, the better the, better the honey production. Um, what else? Um, citrus well, is coming garden, up as well. In my garden, we've got borage coming up again. And the borage is a good one too. Borage. And borage is so hardy. It just, yeah, it just, it just keeps going keeps and giving. <laughs> and, and, the, and so many flowers. And you know what's nice about the flowers? The bees use them, but there's so many that you can go into the garden and you can pick it for salads. And once you've finished uh, cutting up your salad, you just put it on top. And it's so beautiful. You can eat it. It's delicious. It's, yes. So borage is a good one for me. And um, also on this question, what should we plant now? We do not have to have everything in our heads. I've got a fantastic book. Let's hope you can see it. Take root. Let's just see where, there we go. Take root and grow. Now the writer of this book is Susan Torrance um, and she's an avid gardener and um, writer. So this book, for instance, oh, I can just tell you about some of the topics. There's composting in here. There is worm farms, how to make your own worm farms. There's a plan, there's germination charts. Um, We've got in here what to do, what month. There's like a planting calendar or, or preparation calendar, what you should be doing when. So everything does not have to be in your head. You can just take a book that's a good resource like this one, and it's got all the vegetables that you can plant as well. And it tells you when to plant these vegetables, etc. And you can use a lovely resource like this and, um, and just read up and it will give you all the answers now this book is available online i see i checked it out just now um it's cheapest at loot at the moment take lots got it too but it's more expensive so but it's definitely a resource i will be or i will recommend for especially a new gardener and even an experienced garden because we all forget things or not sure about 100% so we can look it up so don't be scared to use a resource the resources are there for a reason All right, so um, we've got, cool. let's check what questions we have I'm there. I'm going to do that as, as we speak. Oh. <laughs> Are you doing it? <laughs> um, I yeah. see there's a question from uh, Anthony. Not sure whether it is out of scope of this talk, um, but Sorry. can you discuss yeah. some do's and don'ts on harvesting bees from other sites? Can we discuss that one now? Getting bees? Was that a yeah, question? Getting, yeah, it's from a do's and don'ts to... <coughs> Sorry, do's and don'ts to harvest bees. I, I suppose it's from a tree or for somebody's house or whatever. Okay. Is it something we can discuss I now? I didn't actually see that question, but cool. Um, first time, but can you discuss? Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's from Anthony. Cool, Anthony, good question. Um, all right, yeah, so that is something we were going to talk about. Um, so it's great timing. Um, yeah, effectively, so that's the other thing. Now, the people that don't have bees and want to have bees. All right, this is what you need. You need a catch box or catch boxes, okay? And these are small versions of a big hive, of the normal length shot hive. Now, catch boxes come in all short shapes and sizes. Well, not necessarily uh, sizes, but they come in different types. You get plastic ones, you get wooden ones. I prefer the wooden ones, but plastic ones are probably a little bit cheaper, but not by much because the frames are what are actually costing you the most amount of money, okay? Um, but ideally what we want to be doing, guys, is you need to have catch boxes. I, if you can and you, if you don't already have hives, uh, the best thing to do is to get hold of, um, try and buy old hives, old colonies, uh, not old colonies, old catch boxes from, an, from a retiree or from somebody who's willing to give you one or two, not give you, but sell you one or two older ones that are maybe dilapidated and are not in such great condition. And the reason being, don't worry about the condition. The bees don't really worry about the condition as long as it's not too holy. Okay. Um, 
what the bees want is they want something that smells like home. It's the same as when, if you know, the old adage, the old story about, you know, if you're wanting to sell a house, make sure that the oven's on and that you've got baked goods in there, okay? Because it smells like home, it smells like where you want to be, like there's lack of cooking going on. So what happens? People are more likely to buy that place or make an offer on that place because it feels more like home. And then that's, that's what we're trying to do with bees. So, A, how do we get bees? You need a catch box or catch boxes. I'd say these two. You need lures or, okay, or attractants. And how do we do that? Well, there's a variety of different ways of doing that. A, as I've just alluded to, basically, is that you use an old catch box. If you don't have that access, if you're already a beekeeper, you're going to have access to this old comb that we've just removed anyway from our maintenance that we've done, and you're going to use that. Once you've squeezed it all out in a stocking, okay, or in a wine press, a honey press, which we have at a beeware shop in, in, in Centurion, we have wine presses, which is using manual labor to squish basically the, all the comb and get the honey and stuff out. Once that stuff's, once the honey's out, you don't ever throw away the wax because you can render that into candles, into, into lotions and creams, but you can also reuse it for your for lures, okay? Because it smells like home. You can melt it with a bit of turpentine uh, or some other kind of alcohol, and then you can paint it on the inside of your, of your empty catch boxes, your new catch boxes, for example. Alternatively, you just literally put pieces in there. That's also fine, because with the heat coming now during the, during the during this period of the year, when anyway, any time going forward, it is going to slightly uh, melt and stuff in there during the, the heat of the day. And that pheromone and that smell is going to be like a welcome mat. It's going to be like going to Las Vegas for a gambler. Okay. It's going to be like, bring me, you know, it's going to be like, bring me home. Okay. Bring me the bakery in my home when I'm kind of looking to buy. Right. So catching bees is that you need a, you need catch boxes. You need lures. We, we sell lemongrass oil at our shopping center and we sell swarm lures that have been field and lab tested uh, with a 70% tracking, col tracking colony luring uh, ability. But if you have an existing colony or an existing apiary and your bees are looking to split okay, at this period of time, it's also another reason why we do maintenance. It's because when bees get to the point where they cannot lay anymore, guess what happens? Okay. The queen decides, well, there's no more space for me here. I need to expand. And when she decides that, she tells the workers to create new queens. Those new queens then get, they, when they're ready, they, they leave the colony or she leaves the colony before they do. Okay? And now what happens is you ended up having 30,000 bees in your colony. And now you only have 20,000 bees in your colony and 10,000 bees have moved off with a new queen. So our swarm lure specifically has been developed for 90% accuracy in being able to trap or catch or attract any splitting colony or swarm from a parent colony within a 50 meter radius of that originating colony. Okay, So it's vital that you guys get hold of our swarm lure at the shop. And in, 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 in addition to that, you can use lemongrass oil or you can use the propolis and or um, old comb mix that I've just explained to you guys early on. So those are some of the things that I discuss on my uh, on my online course, on my online workshop and face-to-face -face workshops we do in Midrand. But uh, if you guys want to join our online one, then uh, we'll give you references at the end. Um, but effectively, so you need lures. You need a place. Where do you put the hearts? Where do you put the catch boxes, the empty boxes to lure the colonies, to lure these tracking swarms? Okay. The number one place to put them is where bees are already. Go figure. If they are already foraging on a crop, Sunflower, aloes, um, lucerne is the big one right now. Citrus is coming up. Um, if, you, if you have any access to those, blue gums, there are some winter blue gums that flower now. If you've got fields of borage, um, sweet basil, uh, blueberries are a good one because they're blueberries. Interestingly enough, there are multiple varieties that flower over this period of time. Okay, uh, So if you have access to a blueberry farm near you, there are opportunities for pollination contracts there where you actually get paid. Now, remember, when you're doing pollination, you're not going to get, you're not expected to get honey because you overpopulate the area in any kind of form of, of commercial pollination contract. You're not expecting to get any, uh, you're not expecting to get any, uh, what you call it, um, any honey, and that's why you get compensated in, in, in a pollination service. Okay, you get paid for the pollination service because you're going to overpopulate, you're going to put more hives per hectare than, than the bees will get honey up, okay? 
that's why you get paid. You're going to potentially lose up to 10% of your colonies because of this as well. And we have to feed them on a regular basis and rotate them. And that's a subject for another day. But the point is, is that blueberries right now are a pretty cool thing to get in touch with if you can. Um, Brilliant. So place your hives, your catch boxes 1.5 meters up. The reason being is that you end up getting stronger colonies being higher up and preferring elevated positions to take, hold, take a hold in then weaker colonies that will fly and this has been proven by a canadian guy a really well-known canadian guy uh in through experiments also been beekeeping for over 20 years um and it's an old trick that i learned from him when i met him i actually met him when i was in ukraine in 2013 we had a long chat about canadian bees and and um uh almond almond pollination because he he tracks he takes about 3,000 colonies to the almonds every year in the states in california so that's one of his things that he does. And I was fascinated by that because it's an up and coming crop in South Africa, actually, commercial crop, almonds growing in South Africa, believe it or not, because right now about 97% of the world's almonds come from California. Okay. Mm. So but South Africa has been, uh, there are a number of people that are testing that out and, and they're testing it as a crop. So they are, it's an up and coming crop in South Africa and quite lucrative as you can imagine. Um, and bees and almonds go hand in hand. Without bees, there's no almonds. There will be zero almonds in the world without bees. Okay? So this is why there are groups of guys in America that are, you know, they take 20,000 colonies down to the, to the, to the orchards on almonds in, in California. And it's not enough. They're short every year. So if anybody wants to take a beekeeping full-time commercially, go to America. You can get a job there and work with them over the almond season if you want. And I'm busy on a project where I'm actually doing a, doing um, collaborations with the guys in America to, to, to connect uh, South African beekeepers who want to go and do migra migratory work there in California over the period and get paid, you know, get paid for that. So watch out, watch out space for that as well coming up. Um, but uh, I think if, are there any other questions around that? Um, there were some questions. I think we've, we need to look at the time Warwick. So I think we could take yeah. two more questions um there's one question from jennifer she's asking for a, from a technical perspective on advice on feeding she said the internet has contradictory information i know we've spoken about feeding the bees quite a lot mm. but uh, she's she's uh, asking very specifically so i don't know if you can give us some more insight on that okay so read the question do you see Sorry, it was that Please give me some advice on how to feed from a technical perspective. The internet has uh, contradictory information, e.g. feeding inside the hive. Inside the hive. Okay. So at the shop, we, we in Centurion, okay, we supply an internal feeder. We basically, it's an internal container. You take two of the frames out. You put our big container frame container inside the, inside the hive. But once you do that, obviously they are ribbed on the inside so that if a bee does fall in, they're able to crawl out. But we do add a couple of extra things into that. So things like you can put cork in there, you can put sticks, you can put anything that's going to sort of float so the bees can grab onto it if they do fall in and they can grab onto it and get out. Okay. Um, typically, this is, it used to be my modus operandi, my preferred, my primary way of feeding bees, but I've, I've since changed. I've switched over to external feeding once I discovered the, the cool product that you can get a little external feeder that goes actually literally slides into the entrance of your hive and you can have a bottle on the outside, a container on the outside where first of all, visually you can see how, how quickly it's being used and then refill it if you need to. And uh, secondly, the chances of a bee drowning in that is zero. Okay. So we stock both of these items in our shop in, in, in Midrand. We ship actually in Centurion rather, and we ship nationally, we, we ship the, throughout nationally and we ship across the cross borders to Zimbabwe, Namibia, Namibia, Zambia, Mozambique, Botswana and Zim at the moment and, uh, and growing. So um, basically anybody who's looking for that stuff, contact us on our phone number and on the website. Uh, I'll post that also in the group too. Um, if you're interested in that, you can speak to us about um, exporting and, and all that sort of thing. Because we, we do already have an existing database of people that are working with us and we are growing that as well as we go forward. Uh, I'm not sure technically if there's anything else. Uh, how often? Frequency maybe? I mean, as I say, I do discuss a lot of this stuff in depth on my, on my online course. But um, frequency is literally how much are the bees eating. So the beauty of this is that, you know, if you're using an external feeder, you can see how quickly it's going to go. And literally a one liter container will be done by the end of the day. You know? Yeah. So um, what, what uh, you know, so 
is that right? Well, it's right for the bees at the time. But what I would recommend though is that you don't want to continue feeding bees forever because what's going to end up happening then is that at some point you are going to have a, a mixing of your um, honey with sugar, with sugar water. We, we don't want that. We don't want to introduce uh, any, any excess sugar water, you know, something that's not actually nectar into your storage of honey. Um, because then, then you're not getting real honey, are you? So, because um, that's what will happen is if you do continue to feed the bees and they find that they are, have an excess, they will convert the honey and the sugar at the same time in the same space, which we don't want to have them do that. So I would only feed now until uh, for the next sort of 18 days at the most and then stop. That's it. Done. Then Jennifer also just said something about attracting rubber bees. I think if you're using the internal um, feeder, then you will eliminate that uh, with the rubber bees, if I'm not correct. I've mistaken Warwick. Um, as far as Lianne's question is concerned, she's in Marmesbury with the canola flowering. Um, I don't know if you were on the call in the beginning, Lianne. We did address um, when to open, how to open, and what to look out for. So maybe you can watch the re recording of the recording of this afterwards. Um, is there any other questions that anybody has with regards to preparation for, for the bees and for your spring garden that anybody would like to, to ask and we can address? I'd like to ask a question, please. Um, yes, what is the best temperature that one should open a hive? So I'm in Johannesburg. It's, for instance, now it's a pretty cold day today. So today wouldn't be a good day. But what temperature is a guideline for one to open up a hive? Well, look, um, obviously the internal climate of a hive is 36 degrees, funny enough, you know, very close to our body temperatures. And uh, the more we change that when we're opening colonies right now, the worse for the bees, especially eggs, because they dry very quickly and they are at risk of freezing, okay, and or getting too cold overexposure, basically, and then they can die or get damaged and injured. Um, so what we don't want to do is, we, that's why I said, don't open your colonies early on. I said, don't open your colonies when it gets too cold. What kind of temperature are we talking about? Well, I think, you know, bees, bees stop flying. They can't fly once, they, uh, once it gets below nine degrees. That gives us an indication. Um, I would say you want to be at least in the range of about 16 degrees when you do this. So this kind of maintenance, ideally, um, you know, I, I, I'd say from about 15, 16 degrees, I would probably do it during the day while most of the foragers are out of the hive and, um, and in the field. Uh, but be fairly quickly about it, you know. It's not something that's supposed to take you an hour long per, per hive. It, this, this literally should be a, a, you know, blitz kind of, obviously you need to be, you know, you know don't be overactive in, your, in any of your beekeeping, but um, you need to be pretty focused, know what you need to be doing, having your bucket ready for container to, to, to take the, the cutout comb, make sure you've got a lid for that, you know, and then when you open, you know, do your smoking, that should be about two to four minutes before you open the hive, open the hive, take the super off, put it on the side, get into the brood box, check your, open up, you know, check each frame quickly. And I mean, that shouldn't be taking you more than a, more than a minute of frame, is way above time that you require for that. Okay. But if you are a beginner, it might take you a bit of time to get the frames out, get the proper, break the proper seals, all that sort of stuff. So I'm allowing for that there, but I wouldn't say more than a five minute inspection here. It should be a tops 10 minute inspection per, per hive. Okay, hopefully that, uh, and then looking at seven. Yeah, and then another thing, I think canola was in the Western Cape because I've never farmed down in the Western Cape. So canola is a good one, winter crop. I think it might've just finished now or it might, uh, something like that. So yeah, um, going forward though, citrus, pretty much citrus, apples, Apples are a good crop for the bees, and, and bees are a good crop for apples. So good, good <laughs> pollinators for apples. Uh, what else is there? Uh, the citrus, lychee is going to be coming up. Anything to do with pumpkins. Grenadillas are amazing, guys, by the way. You can get hold of grenadillas. Lemons. Lemons are on annual. So lemons flower throughout the year. If you can get hold of lemons as a crop, uh, it's, it's a phenomenal crop to have. I've got, I've got an apiary site in... Um, uh, now spread and uh, it's about a 32 hectare spot there and we have honey all year round and they have bumper we've been able to prove that they've been able to get at least um, 25 to 30 percent more crop than they've ever had before before the bees came along even in their best year 
So lemon, lemons are a phenomenal one if you can get hold of those, okay? Coming up as crops would be, but eucalyptus as well is a big one. Aloes are a huge one right now. Aloes are flowering. Aloe daviana is the big one in the high felt area, okay? Uh, and the, just to be quick, just to be, um, if you are going to put hives out on aloe daviana, be aware of, of the Cape bee, the Capensis bee, which is a big problem at the moment, okay? And had not just at the moment, but for the last 20, 25 years, but if, especially over the last sort of five to 10 years. Why am I saying this? The KP, we have spoken about this earlier on uh, in a previous talk uh, briefly, but the KP is an invader bee in the northern part of South Africa, the northern half of South Africa. Okay, we've got two separate subspecies of bees one the KP, which tells you where it's from, pretty much Eastern Cape, Western Cape, and then we've got the half of bee, which is obviously above that line. Okay, um, and what happens is that they work the same. They're both bees, they both collect honey, they both sting, all that sort of stuff. There's only one particular difference, in, and that is that the worker bee can lay both male and female eggs, the only honey bee of its kind that can do this. Okay, very unique to South Africa and to the world. And this has led to a problem because people have brought that KP above that line uh, without knowing probably that they weren't supposed to do this, and that is illegal to do that. Please make sure if you're pollinating or moving your bees at this time, uh, which you probably should be doing as well as part of your part of your next step is that you need to be planning on where you're going to be taking your bees next in order to get uh, the best kind of harvest for your honey and for them as well okay on crops that are flowering at, in in the next couple of weeks okay but please make sure that you check on the line of where the KP is and where the half health where the KP area starts and ends and where the half health bee starts and ends because if you go over that borderline you're going to add to the to the capensis problem now and it is illegal for you to do that okay so you can't take half health you can if you like take half health bees further down but the problem is they, they'll be bred out and that's what's happening now is that the kp has, has moved into the half health area and is now creating hybrids and or outbreeding our half health bee okay which is a biological catastrophe okay um because of how people have been uh, irresponsible so in, in taking your bees to the aloes, just in closing, taking your bees to the aloes, just be aware that you should not put more than one super on that colony because it is, it is prevalent at the aloe daviana that the cape bee is likely to get into your half felt bee colonies and, and cause an issue for you. But on the other hand, the aloe daviana is the best indigenous plant in the country right now. It's a four and four, four and three on, on nectar quality and pollen quality, okay? Uh, as a source right now for the bees. It's like rocket fuel for bees at this point in time. And not only is it rocket fuel in terms of for breeding and for energy and for food and everything, but it actually creates uh, an aggressive state in the bees. It's, it's literally like steroids. So if, you work, if you're trying to work with your bees right now and they're on aloes, good luck to you. You need, you need two bee suits. Two bee suits on it to go work with them, okay? because they go ballistic, literally. I would leave them alone from now. If you're on aloes, leave them alone until the aloes stop flowering. Okay, if you haven't done your maintenance or anything like that now and they're on aloes, leave them be, let them be, excuse the pun. And don't put more than two supers. In fact, I'll only keep it to one super. And I would make sure that you're going to collect and maintain them, at least maintain the supers and frequently exchange them out, okay? Hopefully that's, it's giving you a little bit more insight there. Brilliant. Thank you. I saw Uncle Jock Penta having a good laugh at the B two B suits. <laughs> yeah. All right. Guys, we're running out of time. So I've written there where you can send your questions, Warwick. If you want to, you can still write your email address if somebody can want to contact you with another question related yes, to this okay. topic. I think we need to wrap it up and and guys, good luck with all the um preparations for spring is such an exciting time and uh, come share your experiences with us on self-sufficient homesteading and gardening on Facebook. Uh, we'd love to see your gardens. We'd love to see your bees um, and what you are doing and, and just come share your excitement for this whole uh, issue, this, this homesteading and bee, bee, um, bee uh, topic because um, if you're excited about it, other people will get excited about this. So our questions and we can all help each other to, to build a greater homestead with our bees and our crops. All right, guys, thank you very much. Oh, before Over we go, you. before we finish, I know you shared a book, uh, Tanya. Here's, our, mm -hmm. here's the beekeeping book I wanted to share. Uh, oh, yes. Get it in there. Uh, the Blue Bible. There it is. 
Okay, beekeeping in South Africa, guys. We have that book available at our Centurion shop. Um, we ship it all over the world, actually, um, because it is just, it literally is, as Tanya was saying, it's the Bible of beekeeping. Yeah, that's it, Anthony. Well done. Nice one. So currently the price is four fifty for that um, plus shipping. Okay, but literally, if you wanted to know, it's also got all the, uh, got, it's got two amazing chapters in there with regards to what crops, trees, plants, shrubs, and weeds grow in South Africa for bees. And then when they flower, and what their nectar quality is and what their pollen quality is. And believe it or not, even some honeydew is also used as well by bees. And that comes from the sugar cane, for example, and maize. Uh, so there's lots of things that we talk about in terms of this on our online course and our face-to-face -face courses. But there are the amazing two chapters of... And also what's cool is that it gives you the number of hives per hectare that you should be using if you are prepared to go into pollination and offer contracts to people as a business commercially. So that's also pretty phenomenal. So... We talk about this on our online courses and stuff, but it is in the book if you want to refer to the book uh, on its own. Cool. Uh, okay, hi, thanks. Warwick. I don't know if you can hear me. It's Paul here from Cape Town. Paul, how's it, man? Yeah. Uh, hi, good. sorry. Just to interject quickly, just um, be aware. Of, I am following you guys actually quite a lot on, online and stuff, but obviously you're up in the Transvaal. Yeah. yeah, we in are. Cape Town. Have you got any suppliers down here where we can actually source product? We do. We, we have BUA Cape Town. And uh, that's Jacques, uh, who's also called, he's also got his own, he's now under his own brand as well, Bob and Bees. Um, Jacques Bob Bob is in Freda Hook, Freda Hook Street. Okay. Just type uh, that for us, Warwick, uh, yeah. if you don't mind. Type it up. I will right. type that up. Um, Brilliant. Beware Cape Town. But, um, and yeah, you can get hold of him there. Um, but he also does courses down there too. He also does courses as well. Um, and we've been working. Great does. I was. Uh, I used to do beekeeping many years ago in Zimbabwe and in the old days and stuff. Where we had about fifteen to twenty odd hives. But uh, I'm just up again here yeah, in Cape Town now. So, you know, looking to source a lot of little items and stuff. And okay. I'll probably take your blue book from you as well. So. Excellent. Yeah, champion man. Listen, obviously you're going to be dealing with a KP down there. Uh, yep. But uh, there's nothing wrong with dealing with the KP down there because it's in its home ground. So that's awesome. And you've got the beauty of the proteas available. You've got the canola available. You've got the apples available. Um, you've got onions, by the way, is a good pollination opportunity for anybody who is creating seeds, um, mm -hmm. which is interesting as well, Tanya, for you guys, for the homesteaders, is that anybody who wants to make seeds for onions and, uh, onions and I think um, garlic, um, if anybody's growing any of those in particular, you can get you get a phenomenal yield uh, difference on on the production of the seeds for onions. That's really good to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So obviously you're not. Well, Dania, we actually we have a lot of lot of times, but also fame boss down in the Cape. So we we do take oh, a lot of crops. Granted, yeah. Fame boss and fame the honey yeah. is delicious. I Absolutely. grew up with it. Yeah. <laughs> What's that sugar? Is it called a sugar bush? What's it called? The uh, yes, it is a sugar bush. Yeah, yeah. Sugar bush. Yeah, yeah it is phenomenal yeah. honey as well. Um, yeah, you find all the bee eaters and birds and everything else all over them as well. Yeah. For the and the bushu. It's yeah. called bushu. Hey, otherwise no. Yeah, bushu. Yeah, bushu, bushu, bushu plant. Bushu. I've got a bushu plant in my garden. Yeah, and it's cool. just it's just inundated with bees and with it flowers. It's the most amazing tree. So now yeah. I've 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 really been quite keen to get somebody, uh, Mike. Uh, I think he's the guy who works with. Um, he works with the, with the ARC or something like that, and they've got potentially yep. access to a lab. And I've been I've been asking him, man, can't you get Buchu tested? Because I reckon there's a potential for Buchu and a couple of other of our local local honeys to compete with Manuka. Yeah, it's the problem is well, getting yeah. Yeah, the problem is getting somebody willing to to put money where the where the mouth is, and then you know you should talk to uh, you should to talk to uh, Kirsten Bosch Gardens. Kirsten Bosch themselves have got a development center there and they, they do all those flowers. And in fact, that's where we buy a lot of our plants for home here. We go down there and of course we buy whatever the bees are on, you know. That's awesome. what gets put into our garden. So it's still, uh, it, uh, Kirsten Bosch is an amazing source for those kind of things, yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much to you and Tanya for a fantastic session. If anybody really wants Thanks to stay on longer, we can, if you like, Tanya, I don't mind staying on a little bit longer, but I know we've caught up with our hour now. Um, yes. I'm happy to try and answer some more of those questions just quickly if you want. I mean, do you yeah, want to? We, we can wrap up for the answer? people that, that want they need to, to go. go off. They're yeah. welcome to leave. And uh, yeah, so much, but it's guys. wonderful seeing everybody. And it's great seeing Robert. And it's great seeing Emil.
And Rensha, she's yeah. just, no, Rensha's still here. It's lovely having you here as well. All right. But Thank anybody, you, hey, I'm who's here, waving? Man. Dikon, Asuka, Norma. Dark. There we go. <laughs> and All right. So everybody that wants to leave can leave and the rest that's still Dikon. got some questions. Yes, we're on, waiting for you. Cool. Tanya and Warwick, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes Anthony, hi. Uh, I just want to, um, you know, elaborate further on those do's and don'ts of beekeeping. I'll tell you, I had an experience yesterday. Um, earlier in the week, my brother phoned me who, and said he's got these bees that have uh, invaded his uh, borehole. And I said, well, you know, I can go and smoke them out and put them in and capture them for him. Um, and this is where the do's and don'ts come. Um, I arrived there and uh, took a look at his borehole and it was covered by a dog kennel. One of these dog kennels that is about two foot high, two foot wide and about three foot long. Anyway, when I turned this over, the dog kennel was solid bees. And I'd arrived with one uh, brood box and a big Tupperware that I keep my uh, smoker, etc., in. So, um, after about an hour, I'd uh, tied in about nine frames of um, comb, mm. and it was getting dark, but I still have a pile that I had no option to do other than to leave it under the table that I'd uh, put the, uh, the hive on, um, and I've left it. Now, the weather yesterday wasn't that cold, and I haven't been back to my brother's house, because I live in Dover, or in further south, uh, he lives in Olivedale. Um, what should I have done? Maybe knowing what the weather was going to be like the following day, I should have done nothing. But he's got no water in his house. Um, so we had to get to the ball. So um, is that colony at risk now in the sense that um, I'd really upset them? And, uh, you know, I captured as many bees as I could and put them into the brood box with as much comb as I could find, or as much comb as I could. But um, if I go there this afternoon, what do you think my chances are? Um, yeah, look, it's a difficult one. Uh, whenever doing bee removals or, or uh, bee re replace, you know, uh, Relocation. Relocations, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it's a difficult one. I've done, I did my first 18 months <laughs> of, of, of beekeeping was largely involved in, in bee removals. I learned so much when I was doing that and also was able to earn and fund my, fund my growing in the beekeeping business itself, you know, and, and also beekeeping because it, it costs money to buy the hives, et cetera, and equipment, et cetera. So, yeah, bee removals is a bit of a tough one and that sounds like it's a big colony. Um, you... Did you say you've moved them already? No, I um, extracted them out of the dog kennel and I filled a full brood box with nine frames uh, and the balance I just left on a, on a little rock and uh, in close proximity to the, uh, the original location. Uh, so the, 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 hive, the hive is right next to where the guys were. Right. Uh, it's on a table about a, a meter and a half high. Um, the bees were on the top of the borehole, which is obviously on the ground, and the excess comb is uh, on a little table very close by as well. All right. Um, ideally, ideally, all of the comb that's in that in the in the in the, in the uh, dog box, you should move over. If you have to double brood, double brood, or you could split them. So you take two separate brood ch brood chambers with floors and lids. And, and split it across accordingly, okay? Obviously, what you're gonna end up having is some of the, uh, you know, to one side, you're gonna have brood, uh, you're gonna have comb, rather, that is only honey. Now, obviously, you don't wanna put only honey into one brood, brood box, or you could harvest that if you wanted to. Uh, in fact, I would have probably have kept that for myself. Majority of the, any honey comb, you should have put in a bucket and, and harvested that. Your brother could have had it, you could have had it, family, whatever, split it amongst you, etc. The main thing would have been to keep the brood. Anything with, lay, with eggs in it, sealed brood, eggs, anything like that should have been kept in the brood box, which I think you've probably done from the mm. sound of things. Um, and if it means that you have to fill up two brood boxes or a brood box and a catch box with that, then do that. The main thing really is that the, a lot of the bees, especially probably the queen, is still back in a dog box. Mm. 
she's probably remained. She she goes, she stays with the ship, you know. Um, so well, I took pretty much all of the comb out of the dog box. Um, there wasn't much left. That doesn't matter. If, She'll if, go back. If she, if she if she isn't if she if she wasn't taken over into the into the brood chamber originally anyway, she would still be there in the dog box. And if she was taken over into the brood box, the likelihood of her returning because you've left them two so close together, the likelihood of her trying to go back to the original box is probably quite high. Including a lot of the foragers will go back as well. Anybody okay. that you know. Um, so the so my. When doing a bee removal like this, it's ideal. The ideal situation is to remove the original thing from the area. And so what you've done is, is almost there, you're 75% there, that you put, one, you put a new box next to the old box, but you didn't remove the old box. Hmm. So, so that is a little bit of a dilemma. What I would have done is remove the old box, emptied everything, given it a good shake in front of the other box, in front of your actual brew box, given it all a good shake, cleared, cleaned out everything that was in there and moved it away at least for a couple of days and then um and then leave the the new brew box there in place because that would work as a beacon for them to return to and then your chances of the queen being either in your box or in the dog box would have there would be no risk she would have most likely i mean there's a 95 percent chance that she would have now been in the actual brew box so what can happen now right is that there is a risk that the queen's in the dog box still and if that's the case you need to do the, do this process you need to go there you need to clean out whatever else is left in there. You need to shake the head out of it. Use a brush gently to get all the bees. I, what I would do is actually, when you take the lid off of the brew box, or well, you don't have to take it off actually, I wouldn't take it off. I would, I would use a spare brew box lid or a piece of cardboard or some kind of thing to use a platform at the front entrance. Remove the entrance, remove the entrance blocker if you've got one. Put the, put the, the thingy, uh, uh, a lid or a, or a piece of cardboard or whatever at, as a platform there at the front entrance. And then you're going to shake this dog box, the hell out of the shake this, 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 this dog box. So most of the stuff falls to the ground. When it falls to the ground, it's going to fall onto this platform, the old the, the spare lid. And from there, they're going to smell that there is home in this other box in front of them. And they will go inside there. And if the queen isn't already in there, the likelihood is that she'll fall and she'll run in with the rest of the colony and keep an eye out for her, okay? And if she is already in the box, the, the bees will automatically walk into the box. You'll see them. They all go into like a line and they'll walk, they'll literally march. They do the bee march and they march mm -hmm. into the into the, the, the brew box that you've put there. Okay. Um, cool. But then please do remove the dog box and then give it a proper wash because otherwise it's going to act like an old hive and a new colony is going to move in there. And how to do that is wash it with um, Jay's fluid and water, a 50-50 mix of Jay's fluid and water. And if there isn't going to be any dogs living in that box, you know, the likelihood of colonies moving back in there now shortly can, is probably quite high, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but using the Jay's fluid and water, uh, or bleach and water, is what Jay's fluid is, 50-50 um, mix there is temporary. It's not going to be forever, okay? Okay, great. Yeah, remember, do you. dog mm -hmm. sense smell is like five times stronger than ours. A bee's sense of smell is about 30 times stronger than a dog's. So this is why whenever on a bee removal, you have a lot of repeat business actually, because if it's not done properly, even by pest controllers, especially by pest controllers, because they think terminating the colony is going to do the job, but actually, and then people think that, oh, the bees have come back the following year and the pest controller didn't do their work or the bee remover didn't do their work. No, yeah. a new colony that's just smelt the old one where it was and they moved back in. So if precautions aren't made and preparations aren't made for that colony, for that old smell scent to be taken away, you're just going to get a new colony moving in every time. Good question. Tanya, Great. Thanks, Mike. Pleasure. Oh. Good luck. Morik, yeah, sorry, me, Gianni, and Caitlin again. Just what is the what is the, the thought pattern on putting the queen excluder on the on the bottom of the hive when you transferred a swarm like that? In the old days, we used to put it to prevent the queen from leaving and you know, yeah. keep it locked up. Is that, is that still the done yeah. thing? I, I haven't done that in ages because my, uh, all of my hives are designed so that the floor is not detachable from the brood. It just makes life a lot easier. But yeah, when I used to do the beer removals, I used to do exactly that. I'd have a queen excluder between the floor. I'd say it's specialized, you know, well, I call them specialized because I don't like the floor being detached from the, from the brood. But I used to use them in the old days when I used to do a lot of beer removal. Mm. 18 months. Okay. Do that queen excluder in the middle, 
it does allow the queen, it, it keeps the queen, the queen in place for sure. But don't do it for too long, man. She only needs a couple of weeks. And, then, and, and as long as you've moved them away and you've made them feel comfortable, you could use elastics, by the way. Elastic bands are pretty cool and or uh, string to keep the comb in place on the, high, on the frames when, you, when, you've, when you've cut them out. Put them on. Make sure you move it back and forth on the, on the wire and then use elastic bands. Two elastic bands with five, five rand coin size elastic bands should be perfect. You need two of those, maybe three sometimes. And what happens is you don't even have to take them off. The bees will eat them. They'll eat them off once they've reattached the, the comb. So they're, they're pretty smart that way. If you don't have elastic bands, you just use string. Those you're going to have to cut. Um, but yeah, I've used a, you can use an entrance. Uh, you can take a queen excluder. This is quite cool. You can take a queen excluder and actually cut it. You know, you're going to need to have some serious cable tie cutters kind of thing, but you can bolt cutters, but you can cut the queen excluder into stretches and then put that over the front of the entrance so you take one queen excluder and you can turn that into 10 probably around 10 to 15 um, yeah. queen queen excluder blockers at the front you can do that we do okay. sell them we do sell them like that but you could make your own you know mm -hmm. we sell our own but you can make your own because you okay great yeah great question okay anything else anything for tanya guys uh, on the growing side homesteaders seeds to plant I really like the idea, Tanya, of your tomatoes. 36, 35, 35. 35 that is right. it. I, I remember we spoke about this because I was like, 36? All gold yeah. tomatoes make up all gold tomato sauce. Well, I'll just put another variety in <laughs> so, But you got 35. That's what I remember. So it's like, cool. Yes. Nice one. Oh, we're very um, excited about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for you too, man. You know, and let's get bees. Where are you going to get bees? Because bees, the tomatoes, ooh. ooh. I've got yeah, bees. Bigger tomatoes. Gonna get okay, cool. I've got a really small little little what do you call them? Swarm. Mm -hmm. But they just I never knew a bee cannot fly below nine degrees Celsius. I never knew that. That was really something mm -hmm. interesting for me today. And now I know why they just sit huddled together Huddle. in this little yeah. hive. Oh yeah, no, That's man. what they use so most of their energy for now, you know, doing the winter bears in the whole front. It's keeping warm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope they stay because the food's gonna come. It's uh, it's been a really cold winter and a lot of our plants died of frost. Um, so there's nothing for them. You could really. do the feeding so, thing, right? Eh? Do a feeding station for them. Yeah. Like we've yeah, spoken about absolutely. before. But um, I think somebody's question actually on the robbing side of things, I think somebody did actually have a question on that. So yeah, it's one of the reasons why I don't feed. And we have chatted about this in previous, previous, previous uh, Zoom talks is that um, make sure if you're feeding externally, you don't feed any, any of your bees, unless it's in the external feeder container system we've got from Beware in the shop. Um, make sure you're feeding at a water station that's at least 10 meters away from any colonies. Otherwise you can introduce robbing. That does happen with bees, unfortunately. Okay, great. Well, I think we've had a really, really good session. And if there's no yeah, questions, brilliant. then we can wrap it up. And then we'll see everybody next week again. Um, okay, so sorry guys, sorry. Yes, it's Albert here. <laughs> Obviously, I know we're running out of time. I, just, uh, I started beekeeping two, yeah, two years ago. Uh, I've got uh, two hives at the back of my, my yard here in Rodecrans in West, West Rhine. I just want to check with you guys. Obviously, you guys do only honey, honey bees, the, the, the ones that sting. Now, do anyone doing sting with bees in, in Africa, in, in South Africa specifically? Mm. Um, anything to deal with bee stings? Yeah, bicarbonate soda. You can rub that or vinegar on. Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm referring to stingless bees. Oh, sting stingless bees. Thank you for asking. Yes. Uh, no, we don't have any stingless bees. Okay. Uh, honey bees, that is. Uh, it depends is the closest, huh? No, no, it stings. It depends uh, on things, eh? Um, it depends small, the, just like any other honeybee. Um, but we don't have, as far as I'm aware, honey. we don't have any stingless bees in South Africa. Aside from, that's honeybees, I mean. We do have carpenter bees. But interestingly enough, a lot of people talk, to talk. you know, they ask me about, oh, what about um, bumblebees? And we don't have bumblebees in South Africa. We've got all kinds of other bees. We've got ground bees. We've got, you know, uh, carpenter bees. We've got mason bees. We've got quite a variety of other bees that aren't making honey. Uh, but funny enough, we don't actually have bumblebees. Um, 
so yeah, it's um, it's interesting because bumblebees are actually being used in Europe now and and in uh, America for things like uh, blueberry pollination and and a couple of other things where they're a bit more of a specialist and they can be used because they're stingless. They can be used inside uh, tunnels and um, actual greenhouses and stuff like that. Uh, and they're phenomenal little pollinators too. So there are there are companies that have actually I've met companies in twenty in Ukraine in twenty thirteen that are actually you know they've made a business out of this where they actually uh, um, breed uh, and produce and supply bumblebee colonies to people that are um, pollinating inside greenhouses and tunnels where you know it has to be a closed environment. Now obviously because they can't sting makes it makes it a much more viable um, choice than using bees that will sting in an inter, in, <laughs> in a closed environment they are likely to sting and possibly even swarm yeah good question but yeah i don't know do you guys have stingless bees other no, no not at the moment look, look i'm originally from zim and i i remember i grew up in the rural areas where we had like these small stingless bees that stick around in in, in trunk in tree trunks but I see there is a huge drive, like in Australia at the moment. So you know, uh, with that, that same stingless bee, like it's a very small, tiny bee, but they, 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 their colonies are very small as well. You know, um, yeah. So I thought maybe there's guys that are doing it here in South Africa, but it's no. it's more, more honeybees. More no, the stingless bees, as as far as I know, we don't have any in southern in South Africa anyway. I mean, we've yeah, okay. spoken about them, but I know Australia's got stingless bees. A lot of the Indonesia. Um, India, that kind of area, they've got stingless bees. Mm -hmm. um, they've even, and Australia is interesting enough, they've got an ant, they've got a honey ant. <laughs> With an ant. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's strictly honey, but it's a nectar based, uh, it's a phenomenal insect to see because they actually form, they actually sacrifice themselves uh, when they're harvesting and storing the honey, the, the nectar. And uh, there's whole colonies where they, they actually they hang obviously, and they their abdomens grow and grow and grow to a point where they like look like little bulbs almost. It's amazing to see. You YouTube that it's pretty a phenomenal thing to see. But yeah, the Aborigines used to um, um, obviously harvest them. Uh, no, it's fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. But well, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. So much for the work that you guys are doing as well. I mean, I order my supplies from you guys. I think I bought my, my highs from you guys some time ago. Okay, awesome. Great, man. Yeah. Thanks. So I thought I should jump on on this. This is my first time joining in. Yeah. But thanks for the effort and thanks for everything that you guys are doing. Amazing uh, uh, thing. Thanks yeah. for joining us, Albert. Yeah, it's great to have you guys on board. Yeah. We're glad to be doing this as well. Thanks, Frank. Awesome. Thanks, Tanya. Yeah. Thanks, energy for Thank you, Paul. Robert, because we, we're actually learning a lot. We're doing a lot of cross pollination species of fun between Tanya and myself with regards to the gardening, self sustaining work and stuff. Mm. And um, so it's been really cool. Yeah, I'd like to, like to at some stage, again, get into a discussion with you about aquaponics. Uh, I don't know if you've ever studied aquaponics. Um, if you do it, through, it's a perfect way for growing seeds very fast. Uh, it's done in a, yes. uh, in a um, granite environment, it's not done in sand. Um, yes, I have a yes. system running where you were, we were running it through fish, through tilapia fish, and it's actually it's another one of those projects which, which could go work very well with, uh, with beekeeping as well. Um, it's fantastic in terms of tomato seeds and anything with a leaf just grows like a weed. That's the most amazing thing to have in there, especially if you link it with tilapia fish. Okay, well, we can do a talk on that one time and bring you in and some more yeah. experts on that and we can have a great <coughs> chat about that. Let's do that. Yeah, that sounds phenomenal. Okay. So great. keep watching the page for new topics. Who's that that's talking? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Is it Paul that's Thanks, talking guy. about that? Yeah, that it was, was Paul. 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 Okay, cool. Thanks, yes. Paul. Great. Thanks again, Tanya, as well. Hey, awesome to chat. Thanks. It was uh, lovely. Really enjoying having the, having the um, Zoom talks with you. It's been awesome. So look forward to the next one next Friday. Yes, we'll see you then. Thanks, right, guys. Bye. Okay, bye. bye. bye.